All right, g'day guys, welcome back to yet another video on the True Footy YouTube channel. Today, we are doing, you know, once again, trade content, because apparently that's all I can do lately. But this time with a little bit of a twist, obviously we've been going hard at sort of covering the 2021 AFL trade period and all the potential deals that did go down or didn't go down. And as we all know, that trade period kind of fell flat in terms of, it was probably the least exciting finish to a trade period uh, that we've ever seen. So there was a lot of anticipation, you know, about potential deals that were gonna go down, particularly around deadline day, because historically, Historically, deadline day has been really, really exciting in the past. This year, not so much. So what I thought would be interesting would be to take a look in 12 months into the future about potential deals that might happen in the 2022 trade period. Now, just a disclaimer, obviously there is going to be a fair bit of talking out my ass in this particular video. I don't have any inside knowledge. I'm just having a bit of a punt based on a little bit of information, I guess, that we learned from this particular trade period and also having a look at what players are out of contract both next year and the following year and which players might be free agents as well. So just as a bit of fun, I'm going to have a stab at 10 or 11 trades that I think may go down 12 months from now. As always, guys, I invite you to please consider subscribing to the channel. As you can see below, still less than half of you who watch the videos have actually subscribed to the channel. So I wouldn't really appreciate it if you could simply hit subscribe. But enough waffling, let's get into some predictions for next year's trades. I guess a logical place to start would be looking at the deals that almost went through in the 2021 trade period and assessing whether or not they are likely to go ahead 12 months from now. In particular, I'm talking about, I guess, first of all, Rory Lobb, who was talked about as moving from the Fremantle Dockers back to his original club, the GWS Giants. This was a deal that struggled to get off the ground. The Giants sort of highlighted Lobb as a player of need. They kind of need both a ruck and a forward, even though I think he wants to play exclusively forward. He certainly hasn't hit the market Fremantle in terms of paying back the ridiculous salary that he's allegedly on at Fremantle, which is in excess of $700,000 a year. GWS tried to get it done, but Fremantle weren't willing to pay some of his salary, which would have been a key part in that deal. And GWS were weren't willing to pay more than a future second rounder, I think it was, for Lobb's services. Lobb was reportedly keen on a move back to Sydney, but obviously being contracted, he couldn't necessarily force his way out. And I feel like both of these clubs had a bit more on their plate to deal with this particular trade period, and that's why this deal kind of fell through. In my opinion, I think GWS will go again at Rory Lobb next year. I think they're right in the thick of their own premiership window, and a tall target up forward is certainly a need for them, and I think they'll look at trying to reunite Jesse Hogan with Rory Lobb, because that went so well at Fremantle. No, but in all seriousness, I don't think Fremantle's super invested in Lobb. Equally, I think Lobb is pretty open to going back to Sydney. I think he feels a need for the Giants, and therefore I do expect that Rory Lobb will get traded to GWS this time next year. On the similar thread of a deal not going through at the last minute involving the GWS Giants, Bobby Hill was, of course, trying to request a trade to Victoria last minute, specifically Essendon, and being contracted, GWS blocked the trade and decided they couldn't let him go, considering their needs for a small forward on the list to begin with. If what you accept is true about Bobby Hill wanting to be in Victoria to be closer to family because I believe his partner is pregnant or something like that. He wants to go there for family reasons. Then you can imagine he's probably going to push for it again in 12 months time. By that time, GWS hopefully may have addressed their need for a small forward and probably have to accept the fact that they're probably going to lose Bobby Hill. He will be out of contract. So I do expect Bobby Hill will get traded to Victoria, whether it be Essendon specifically, most likely, but I think Collingwood was also a sneaky chance there as well. So if I had to lock in a prediction, I'll say Bobby Hill does get traded to Essendon 12 months from now. One other final deadline day deal that didn't get done was Tristan Cherry from North Melbourne to St Kilda. St Kilda needing some ruck forward depth and Cherry was a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of getting games for North Melbourne. My personal belief is that St Kilda will probably move on to find other avenues to try and to fill that list spot and in 12 months time we're going to be one year closer to Todd Goldstein hanging up the boots as well. So I do think there's a good chance that North Melbourne can actually talk Tristan Cherry into staying and I think they're more likely to retain him. I think St Kilda will find their depth elsewhere and this deal won't go down in 12 months. So moving on from the deals that almost got done this year, let's talk about the juicy topic of Collingwood's salary cap. And in particular, they've got three free agents coming out of contract at the end of next year in Jordan Degoe, Darcy Moore, and Braden Maynard. Three really essential players you'd think, almost untradeable, but Collingwood's salary situation may mean that they can't keep all three of them. So if you're Collingwood and you have to ward off, you know, other clubs coming for three of your better young talents in Dugowie, Maynard, and Moore, which ones do you prioritize? For me personally, I think Jordan Dugowie should be a priority for them. He's such an explosive game breaker. And I think when you have a potential player like that, who could be, you know, a Petrarca player, he could be a Dusty Martin player in that same sort of explosive forward half player that can roll through the guts. I think he's too critical for them to let go. So I think he should absolutely be a priority and equally Darcy Moore as well as a favorite son of the club. He's literally a father son of the club. And on top of that, you know, being a key position defender, he has the potential to be one of the very best when he 
he's on top form as well. So I think the fact that he's a key position player as well will hold him in slightly higher stead than Braden Maynard. So if we're just entertaining the idea that Collingwood can't keep all three, Braden Maynard may be the one that gets squeezed out as a restricted free agent, which means Collingwood could match the offer for his services and then force a trade. Now you could probably logically think that if Collingwood can afford to match a bid for Braden Maynard, he's probably going to stay, right? So let's entertain the possibility that they can't match a bid for Braden Maynard, and then it becomes who is the most likely team to recruit Braden Maynard from Collingwood as a free agent. Well, I believe he's been linked to both Adelaide and Melbourne in the past. Adelaide, I think, will have their own hands full a little bit too much in this particular trade period, and that's stuff I will get to later in this video. As for the Ds, it seems really hard for them to fit Maynard into their back six when you've got medium defenders in Salem and Rivers and potentially a Tomlinson in there as well. I know Tomlinson could probably push up to a wing. Maybe you could fit him into that side, but it's a lot to pay for a player that will be best 22, will improve you, but... Melbourne needs to also consider that a lot of the young players are going to be costing them more in terms of salary as the years go by. So it is risky for them to maybe offer a massive contract to a Braden Maynard when they've got, you know, Luke Jackson, Christian Petrarca, Clayton Oliver coming out of contract in the next few years. So long story short, I don't know if I see Maynard going to either of those clubs. If I had to throw up a left field suggestion, I would say Richmond might come knocking on the door for a Bashar Hooli replacement as that skillful running defender. So let's lock in a left field prediction. I will say Braden Maynard gets signed by Richmond. Let's talk about the Gold Coast Suns because they're often a topic of uh, the trade period, although we didn't really see that too much this year. For them to only lose Will Brody, and in fact, that might have been it off the top of my head. That's a massive win for them. Normally, they lose a best 22 player or worse. But this is the year, unfortunately, that the young South Australian talents in Isaac Rankin and Jack Lacocious come out of contract, among others. Isaac Rankin hasn't been in the hottest form for the Gold Coast Suns. It is hard to when you are a small creative forward in a team that isn't winning games. So when your form goes to shit, you look really, really bad. And often the team can't even help you lift out of that slump if they're not giving you enough supply. So my logic with this one is I actually think Rankin is unlikely to have a great year at the Gold Coast Suns. Just a bit of a gut feeling. I hope he does. But if he does struggle, then I think there's a good chance that he requests a trade home to Adelaide to join the Adelaide Crows. What will it cost? Well, I think if he has another year like this year, despite the fact that he was pick three a number of years ago, he probably goes for a pick in the 20s. I hope that's not the case. I want Gold Coast to succeed, but I think Adelaide might get a bit of a discount here. On the flip side for the Suns, I reckon I'll back them in to keep Jack Lacocious. I'm sure Adelaide will come knocking for them both. Jack Lacocious was pick two in the 2018 draft right behind Sam Walsh, and he's been fantastic to be honest, drafted as a key forward, played more as a running defender who uses the ball really well out of the back half. I love the niche that he's carved for himself in that team. Bit of talk, he plays forward this year alongside Ben King and Sam Day in that forward line. Is that appeasing Jack Lacocious because that's where he wants to play? I'm not too sure, but I'll back in that approach because I think he's a player that they really need to keep. So my logic is Lacocious will thrive for the Gold Coast Suns and they'll be able to keep him, rank him, Maybe not so much, and Adelaide will secure him. As we move down the list, I'm seeing more and more Gold Coast Suns names. I'm going to suggest that Braden Fiorini might make a move away from the club next year. He's not out of contract, but he's a player that's probably not super valued at the Gold Coast Suns, despite it not being, you know, the strongest of midfields. He seems to dominate statistically, but maybe there's a bit of a criticism about the way he moves the ball because he can't crack a consistent game. He only played nine games for them this year at an average of 26 disposals a game. Gold Coast will look at their young midfield and think, you know what, I'd rather give those games to Raul Anderson, Elijah Hollands. Braden Fiorini, despite being contracted, might be one that the Gold Coast look to offer to some other club in Victoria, most likely where he's from, and say, hey, we'll give you Fiorini fairly cheaply if you can get his salary off our books. And that's where I think it could be a bit of cheap depth for a Victorian club in the same mold as Luke Dunstan for Melbourne this year. Who are the candidates for that? Well, Dunstan was linked to Essendon this year. They probably could use a little bit of experience, ready-made midfield depth. And I'll say Fiorini is a good chance to move to a club like Essendon in 20 12 months time. There's a couple of Gold Coast boys on their list that I think are worth keeping tabs on. Sam Flanders is not out of contract and it kind of depends how good Gold Coast are at retaining their other talents. If they say keep a Lacocious, Rankin, etc. Suddenly I think Flanders spot on the list becomes a little bit vulnerable, especially if he's on a fair amount of money. Now they did trade up for him in the draft that he was taken in. Having said that, he hasn't set the world on fire and while you know I, I'm not writing him off by any stretch, these types generally are able to be prized loose of clubs when they're not quite hitting their mark in their first 
first few seasons. So at the moment, I won't predict Sam Flanders to move because it really depends on how well they retain their other players. But if they are successful and they need to offload some salary, then I think he is vulnerable. On the flip side, Elijah Hollands is a player that hasn't even debuted for them yet. I think he will be targeted hard because he comes out of contract this year as well. But I think he's the more loyal type and he will stay. It's funny to think I've just talked about four or five Gold Coast players and I haven't even talked about probably the biggest one in Ben King, who becomes out of contract at the end of the 2022 season. He just had a fantastic breakout year for the Suns, kicking 47 goals, 25 in a team that really struggled. Of course, he's been linked to both Essendon and St. Kilda, the latter for whom his twin brother Max plays for as well. And I think there's going to be a strong temptation for those boys to play together. Reportedly very close. I think they were pretty sad when they got drafted to separate clubs that they were never going to play together again. Essendon will be making a big play for Ben if you believe all the reports, but I do think St. Kilda is kind of in the box seat here. There's a chance to play his career out for a Victorian club with his twin brother, Max. The flip side of that is how does St. Kilda manage both of those players in the same forward line? To be honest, I think the romance of it will get the better of them. And I think St. Kilda will go hard at Ben King. I think they'll succeed. And I reckon he will be at St. Kilda 12 months from now. What does it cost? Well, he's out of contract, but still, if he puts together another season like he did this year, I think St. Kilda will have to part ways with two first rounders. If he's contracted, I think he's worth even more than that. But at the end of the day, he's uncontracted. So two middle range first rounders, which is probably what St. Kilda are going to have. That will most likely get the deal done, in my opinion. Another player that is out of contract at the end of 2022 that keeps mysteriously getting linked to trades home to South Australia, but never actually moving is Aaron Francis. But the fact he's out of contract this year makes me think perhaps there's no smoke without fire. And I think he may request a trade from Essendon to a South Australian club at the end of the year. He won't be a free agent, which is important to note. So it'll have to be facilitated as a trade. I think as a 25 year old or whatever he will be at the time, I think he's probably a better fit for the Adelaide Crows as a young up and coming side. I'm sure Port Adelaide will be interested too. I'm going to pluck a bit of a roughie. Don't have too much of a gut feel behind it, but let's say Aaron Francis joins Port Adelaide at the end of next year. Speaking of no smoke without fire, let's talk about Lockie Neal for a second as well, who was originally reported to have two more years left on his contract at Brisbane. But from what I can gather, he's actually out of contract at the end of next year. There was a bit of murmuring that he was linked to a move home to Fremantle, who's going to try and make that happen, but that got shut down pretty quickly. But there's a bit of talk, you know, he's starting a young family. He's got a miso from Perth, I believe. Doesn't strike me as the most loyal bloke to his club. I think that's fair to suggest. I think that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, he walked out of Fremantle to join a club that he thought was going to be better next year. Not that I'm necessarily judging that, but by that logic, I think Lockie Neal will have no issue turning his back on Brisbane at the end of his only contract there. I'm going to suggest, I think Lockie Neal does make it back to Fremantle in 12 months time. Another player that was talked about as potentially moving at the end of this trade period was Chad Wingard from the Hawthorne Footy Club. The situation is Sam Mitchell wants a young list, a good look at the top end of the draft, and he was looking to trade some experienced players such as a Wingard to other clubs for picks in the draft. Now, as you'll know by now, that deal didn't eventuate because Wingard was contracted and had every right to say, hey, I want to stay playing for Hawthorne. But the situation is he is out of contract, I believe. So with that being the case, it's hard to imagine that in 12 months time, Hawthorne suddenly feel that, oh, Chad Wingard does fit our future plans. Now, I suppose this is entirely dependent on the demand for Wingard and what teams are offering by means of a trade. But for me, it's hard to see Chad Wingard still being in Hawthorne 12 months from now. I reckon GWS will come knocking on the door. They really need an established small forward in their team. And like I said, I think they will fancy themselves as in the premiership window. I think West Coast will have a bit of preliminary interest depending on how their salary cap situation is. Frankly, I'm sure there'll be more teams than that, but I could even see him heading to a Geelong as well. Geelong love their older players. They love prolonging their premiership window. And as such, I think he will actually end up at a club like Geelong 12 months from now. Some other news we heard late in this trade period was that Sydney were making a big play for Tom Barras of the West Coast Eagles as a pre-agent, which means he was out of contract at the end of next year. And the notion being that West Coast, knowing he was a free agent 12 months from now, would try and trade early to maximize their potential gain. Sydney were very keen on Tom Barras in his draft year, but the Eagles pipped him at the post. Sydney really need an established key defender as well. From all reports, the Eagles turned down that particular trade, but it was never actually reported whether Tom Barras was interested in a move. Personally, Barras doesn't strike me as a particularly loyal type, and I think he'll look at Jeremy McGovern in that same back line and someone like a Harry Edwards coming through as well. I think it will really appeal to Barras to move to somewhere like Sydney and be the number one defender. And to be honest, I think he's good enough to become that. There's also to consider that Buddy Franklin's likely retiring in 12 months, a bit of an assumption there, but either way, his massive contract ends as well. So they're going to have some serious money to play with. Long story short, I think Tom Barras does join the Sydney Swans as a free agent next year. Being restricted, the Eagles have the ability to 
to match an offer and then force a trade. And it really depends on their salary cap situations. I think the Eagles are probably going to have a few retirements of their own, so they may be able to match it. And this is where I think the Eagles will make a big play for Logan McDonald to be part of that trade. Much like we got Josh Kennedy in the Chris Judd deal, I think we'll push for the young, talented key forward to go home. But... I don't think we'll be successful. I think Sydney will retain Logan McDonald and also get Tom Barras as well. So there you have it, guys. That is my crack at some early 2022 trade predictions. Let me know in the comments what you think I got right, what you think I got wrong. Again, it is, at the end of the day, just a bit of fun. I'm just having a bit of a punt, so don't take it too personally if I predicted a trade that you don't particularly like. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for more content coming out on the channel. It'll continue to be coming pretty thick and fast, maybe not at the same rate that I was doing during the trade period, but still going to try and be consistent as possible. Thanks for all the support lately, guys. Hope you're enjoying the content, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.